by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained an introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulation, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given us. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, I'm sorry I couldn't visit with you all more. I'm afraid I'm just getting over pneumonia, and I, I just don't have my energy. It got up and went somewhere, and I haven't found it yet. So I wanted to save my voice for being able to share this wonderful text with you. I think... Uh, as I watch TV, I know you do too, and I see people around the world trying to approach God in such strange, bizarre ways. Um, man realizes there's a need, but only divine revelation tells us how to meet that need. Um, I, don't, I didn't know the brother who prayed, but I'm so grateful for that prayer. I hope you are praying that God will have mercy on us as a society. Uh, there is revival happening around the world, but it is not happening in the Western world. And as we turn more and more to self and sin and secularism, I think it exacerbates the tremendous message of hope that we have. But we've got to be very, very clear of how people come to that hope. We don't come in human performance. We don't come in creeds. We don't come in human activity. We have to come in repentance and faith. Amen? Now, I just thank God for the Protestant Reformation because it, it again was trying to clarify what God has said about how humans need to approach Him. You know, uh, Martin Luther said that the clearest expression of the gospel is the text we're looking at today. Think about that. The clearest expression of the gospel in the New Testament, he said, was Romans chapter 5. So I would like to work through this with you. I'm more of a teacher-preacher than just a preacher, so long ago I left three points and decided to do text. So if you brought your Bibles, I hope you will look with me. I want to kind of explicate this in this way. I want to remind you that the only inspired person in Bible study is the original author. Our goal is to try to understand what the only inspired person, the original author, was saying to the people who read this or heard this for the first time. So we've got to put ourselves back into that day. And friends, we cannot pick five or eleven verses out of the middle of a book you would not let anybody read anything else that way. You wouldn't pick up the Marshall News Messenger and pick up the third paragraph and read it and say you understood the article. Why in the world will we tiptoe through the Bible, pick out the verses we like, read one or two verses, and think we can understand the mind of God? We've got to look at the book first. And this probably is the clearest expression of the good news because Paul is writing this book to explain his gospel to a church that he did not start, the church in Rome. And he wants this church to help him go on a mission to Spain. So he is going to lay out what he believes and what he has been preaching uh, to Gentiles because there is so much bad information about what Paul preached and what Paul meant. So Paul... In probably the most neutral place. Now, there is, a, there is a historical setting here. There is some tension in the church at Rome between the Jewish believing leaders and the Gentile believing leaders. And, of course, you know history, how the Roman Empire, particularly Nero, decided to blame the Jews for the fire he started because he wanted to rebuild part of Rome. And he issued a decree that Jewish rites could not be done in the capital. And that caused... Many of these um, Jewish believers, because they're, it's still very early, caused them to leave. Priscilla and Aquila were some of those Jewish leaders who left. And in that vacuum, Gentile leaders took over the church. 
And when, they, when the Jewish leaders finally came back, there was real jealousy and tension between these two groups in the Roman church. You can see this throughout the book of Romans. I think Romans 9 through 11 is an attempt to address that issue of that jealousy between these leadership groups. Now, if you'll just kind of think through me, not turn your Bibles, we don't have time, but you would think through me this outline of Romans. 1 through 8, or 1 through 11, is the doctrinal section. All of Paul's books break into halves. A doctrinal section that meets the immediate need for which he is writing, and then the practical section, how to apply that doctrine. And that's 12 through 16, the practical section. Now, chapter 1, 18 through 3, um, about 3, 18 is the bad news. Now, friends, the good news is only good news in light of the bad news. And the bad news is, the summary is in 323. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In chapter 1, Paul addresses immoral pagans. And I hope you know our lives are being more and more surrounded by immoral pagans. Our nation has become a nation of immorality and paganism. If you don't know that, holy moly. <laughs> In chapter 2, we deal with moral pagans, uh, the Stoics. Um, there's a lot of people who are moral but don't know Jesus. Friends, they're as lost as immoral. They're just harder to reach because they think they're okay. And then in chapter 3, Paul says Jews. Even Jews, if they don't trust Jesus Christ, have absolutely no hope. I want to remind you of the scandal of the exclusivism of the gospel. It is expressed so well, not by Bob, but by Jesus. When in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I have no right as a gospel preacher to lower the standard because my day has become secular. There is one and only one way to God, and that's through Christ. It has nothing to do with denominations. It has nothing to do with creeds. But it has everything to do with the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, beginning after that, the great need of all human beings, Paul starts in chapter 4 to say to you, this is not something new. The gospel is not plan B. God was not surprised with the sin of Adam and Eve, and God was not surprised by the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to die. He told his disciples that several times. They could not understand it before it happened. But he came to die and to give his life a ransom for many. So here we have in chapter 4, this is not something new. And Paul goes back to Genesis 12. Not the first um, time he spoke to Abraham, that is tw in Genesis 12. This is 15. In 15.6 is one of the keys that the New Testament uses to try to explain the gospel. And it goes like this. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, I want to remind you, Abraham did not believe in Jesus Christ in Genesis 15. There was no revelation of Jesus Christ to Abraham. God told Abraham he's going to have a child. Abraham had tried and tried and tried for I don't know how long and knew that his wife could not and he was too old. But Abraham believed God. What this promise is, is this. We believe what God says to us and act on it. Abraham did that. And that was counted as righteousness to him. Now, I don't know if you have read Abraham's life. Abraham is a dingbat. I mean, God gave him the ability to have children. He started having children everywhere. Friends, the Jew-Arab problem goes back to Abraham and Ishmael. Abraham is the one who is willing to give his wife away to save his own life. This is no special, unique, wonderful person. This is a human being that God chose to act through that the whole world might come to know him. And that same thing is true of Israel. Now, I want to remind you, people say, well, Israel's wonderful. Israel is a stiff-necked, rebellious people. They have always been. And God chose them to magnify his grace. The diamond looks all the brighter in a dark background. Israel has always been an unfaithful people which highlights what? The faithfulness of God. So in chapter 4, Paul picks up on God's promises to Abraham and says this has always been the way. The Old Testament is not law and the New Testament grace. It has always been grace. 
and it has always been the absolute requirement of faith. I guess as an Old Testament professor, one of the idioms uh, that has grabbed me so deeply is in Deuteronomy 10 where it says, you must circumcise your heart. It's not outward circumcision that's the key to being right with God. I want to remind you of Romans 2, 28 and 29 that says it's not physical circumcision that makes one a child of Abraham, but spiritual circumcision, the circumcision of the heart. So it is a faith relationship. Before I get into this, I want to say as shockingly as I know how, no one ever has been or ever can be saved by faith. Faith cannot save. What saves? For by grace you have been saved through faith. And look at these disclaimers. Not of yourself, gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Friends, our hope is not in our goosebumps, in our decisions, in how high we jump. Our hope is in the unchanging character of God, the gracious, merciful God of history. Now, in light of that, I'd like to look at chapter 5 quickly. Now, you know in the book of Romans, therefores are really important. And what they say is summing up what has gone before now. Now, we're not sure how far back that therefore go. Does it go all the way back to chapter 1? Does it go back to chapter 4? But based on what Paul has said about the need for all men to be right with God and that faith has always been God's way of man receiving his gift of grace. Based on that, and by the way, in the Greek text, the word having been justified is fronted in this first sentence for emphasis. Now, this is really important. The word justified, and I want to remind you, look at me for a minute. The writers of the New Testament, except for Luke, are all Hebrew thinkers writing in street Greek. These are Jewish people, and they're trying to express this Jewish theology in a way that of the language of commerce of the first century world, which means to go all over the Mediterranean world. So to understand these words, you, can't, you don't go to a Greek dictionary. You go to the Septuagint, which is the same language translation of the Old Testament. This word justified, everywhere in the Old Testament, the word right, the word righteousness, the word just, the word justified or justification, all of those are one Hebrew root. And that Hebrew root, when God wanted to pick something so he could explain his character to fallen mankind, he picked a construction metaphor. Now, in the ancient world, to judge the straightness, uh, vertically they used a plumb line. But horizontally, they used a long, what we would call a bamboo pole. They called it a river reed. That is the word just, justification, right, righteousness. Now put it this way. It is not by accident that all the words for sin, both in Hebrew and in Greek, mean deviation from the standard. And what we usually say is, well, I'm not bad as old Joe. Well, Joe ain't the standard, dude. The perfect God is the standard, and all of us are crooked when compared to the perfect standard. So the word having been justified means there is a standard, and we somehow have been conformed to that standard. How have we been conformed to that standard? It's not, our, it's not what we do. It's not what we believe. It's not a creed. It's not the abundance of things we don't do or do. So how do we get right with God? Now, that's the theological issue of this chapter. Therefore, having been justified by faith. Now, there are five things, I think, that, that it says that we have. Now, as a Western thinker, I would have turned this around. Verses 1 through 5 are the, the benefits of being justified. Verses 6 through 11 is the, how we're justified, the basis of being justified. Now, normally we would think here's the basis and here's the result. So this is backwards to us, but let's deal with it in the way that Paul gave it. Notice the five things that we have been given by faith through the gracious God. Number one, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, friends... Can you remember back in the days before you became a committed Christian? I can still remember, still remember. 
I grew up in Houston. I can remember those thunder boomers coming in the afternoon from the Gulf. Grew up in a Christian home. Grew up going to Sunday school. And I'd see those thunder clouds and I'd go, it's the second coming. I'd want to go hide in the closet. I can remember being scared to death of God. Even as a young child, I knew I did things that wasn't pleasing to God. Terrified me having to stand before God. I can remember the night I walked home from church after trusting Christ. And look it up in the stars. And for the first time in my life, not being afraid of God. This word peace is used in three distinct ways in the New Testament. Number one, we've come to have peace with God. When you get in times of fear, times of distress, times in chaos, is there a peace? Lack of peace is a sure sign that we don't know God. Peace is the marker of those who come to know Him. There is a peace that comes. It's based on who God is. It's based on what Christ has done. It's based on us receiving the truth of the gospel. And then it cannot, can't, I'm screaming now if I had the voice. It cannot be affected by circumstances. Amen? If your peace and joy is affected by circumstances, it's not a biblical peace and joy. Our peace and joy supersedes circumstances because it's a promise of Scripture and it's an attribute of the God. We, you, in your worship service, you talked about the character of God. Friends, it's not enough to talk about the character of God if you don't live in light of those great truths. Amen? We say we say that, but now how do we live when the world caves in and the things turn black? Is he still the God of peace? Is he still the God of grace? Absolutely. We have peace with God. Now, friends, if you have peace with God, you're going to have peace with one another. Please don't tell me, if I was in 1 John, I would say, don't tell me you know God whom you haven't seen and hate your brother whom you have seen. If you have peace with God, you're going to have peace with others. And the reason is God loves those others as much as he loves you. And Jesus died for those others as much as he loves you. It reminds me of Romans, um, I think it's 14, where it says, Would you, for your so-called freedom, you strong brother, destroy the man for whom Christ died? No, no, no. When we know God, people take on a dignity. And that dignity works out in us loving them, praying for them, and trying to help them come to Christ. We have peace with God. (laughs) I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But let it happen. Because I know the one who holds tomorrow. Wish I could sing. I'd sing that black hymn. (laughs) We know the one who holds tomorrow. Why? Because we know God. We have peace with God. Second one. Verse 2. We have obtained an introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Now, this word introduction is used quite often, most often in the book of Hebrews. It means a personal introduction to someone in power. If you wanted to go see the governor, could you go see him today? You could not. Jesus Christ has brought us in the throne room of God and personally introduced us to God the Father. We have a personal introduction because of being justified. We look also in verse 2. We exult in the hope of the glory of God. Now, the word exult, I don't know if you noticed it through here, is used several times. I don't use the word exult very often, but I'm surprised at some of the things we exult in. Now, the problem about interpreting the Bible for Westerners, we put an English definition on these words. How many sermons has someone said, Webster's Dictionary says? Who cares what Webster's Dictionary says about anything in Bible study? This is certainly not English. The word hope is a maybe, could be word. The Greek word for hope has none of that connotation. The word hope is always used with the promise of some kind of eschatological fulfillment of the believer's faith. This is the idea we know that when we stand before God, we're going to be accepted by Him. That's why we have no fear, because we know who we are in Christ. This is hope. And the string that follows this is very surprising. I hope it was surprising to you when I read it. We exult in tribulation. Did I misread that? Is that a strange translation? Do you exult in tribulation? Now, the reason we exult in tribulation, now think with me, if Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, Hebrews 5, 8, 
is said to be perfected by the things that he suffered. Now, of course, we're speaking of his humanity. But if God's mechanism to make us what we're supposed to be is adversity, then why do we run from it so hard and fast? We are surprised. Let me quote 1 Peter 4, beginning in about verse, I think it's, uh, I've forgotten what verse, 12 or 16. Why are you surprised when the fiery ordeals come upon you as though some strange thing were happening to you? My friend, if the world rejected Jesus, why do you think it's not going to reject you? The problem with American Christianity, we're not rejected very much by anybody, which means we have the tattoo of the world right on our forehead. It means we've been so captured by culture, there's nothing unique about our lives. If we follow him, there is a price to be paid. And there's no way to spiritual maturity without that price. I think that problems are, are needed for the spirituality, which is like an analogy of a muscle. Muscles only grow against resistance. Spirituality only grows in resistance. I think that's surprising to us, but I think it's absolutely true. Now, there is a progression here. We result in tribulation. Why? Because it brings about perseverance. Now, you know, my background is Baptist. Uh, people say, why are you a Baptist? Because my mother was. Most of you are Presbyterians because your mother was. Get over it. <laughs> the whole point here is, you know, in my, in, in my denomination, we have so overemphasized assurance that we've wiped out about half the Bible. May I admit to you perseverance is as biblical a doctrine as assurance? I want to remind you of the letter of the seven churches. At the end of every letter, it says, To him who overcomes, I'll give the crown of life. Perseverance is absolutely crucial. I would be so bold to say this. I think as there are qualifications for the Old Testament covenant, there are things you have to do. There are things you have to do for the New Testament, too. I've come to list four things that I think are absolutely irreducible minimums of the new covenant. Repentance, faith, obedience, and perseverance. My denomination is forever asking me, well, Bob, which ones can I leave out and still go to heaven when I die? Which is a horrible understanding of turning salvation into a ticket to heaven instead of a Christ-likeness now. I would submit to you the goal of Christianity is not that you go to heaven when you die, but Christ's likeness now so others can go to heaven with you when they die. Amen? This is not all about you. This is not a bus ticket to heaven. This is not an insurance policy. It's a call to Christ's likeness. I believe it was in, I think it was in your service. This, didn't you read 2 Corinthians 5? Would you read that again for me? Second, I think it was 2 Corinthians 5, 13 and 14, right? You left your notes, didn't you? <laughs> I want you to hear this. <coughs> Second Corinthians five, thirteen and fourteen. I think you're in First Corinthians. Are you in Second? Is that in the book? Is that not talking about death to self? Is that not a strange verse for American Christianity? We choose churches by what they serve on Wednesday night. Friends, you were called to lay down your life. You were called for perseverance. And that's what perseverance leads to, proven character. And proven character leads to hope. I submit to you we're all in process. None of us have arrived. But thank God we know where we're going to arrive. And thank God we know why we're going to arrive. And thank God we know who that enables us to arrive. Now, if you notice the fourth thing that we've been given. First, we have peace with God. Second, we've obtained a personal introduction. Third, we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Four, look at verse five, through the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. I think we ignore that. This is, we are not on our own in this fight. I would submit to you this is the age of the Spirit. That part of the Trinity is active in the world today. Now, I know Jesus still intercedes for us. Thank God for that. But that part of the Trinity that's active in the world today to accomplish God's will is the Holy Spirit. We ignore him at our peril.
People say, we need more of the Holy Spirit. Friends, Romans is going to say, you either have the Holy Spirit or you're not a Christian. We don't need more of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit needs more of us. The roadblock is not we need more of him. The roadblock is we're not available to him. So I assure you the gift of the Holy Spirit is one of the most important gifts that we can possibly have. The Holy Spirit never puts the spotlight on himself. But the Holy Spirit always puts the spotlight on the words and teachings of Jesus and help us understand that and how to apply it to our lives today. Thank God for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen? If he is not here today, there is no use of me preaching and no use of you listening. And there's nobody can be saved without his presence and power. And nobody who can persevere without his presence and power. And no way to be Christ-like without his presence and power. Thank God for the benefits of being made right with God. Now, beginning in verses 6 through 11, quickly. <laughs> I'm a visitor. I can go over time. I want you to notice the parallelism of verses 6, 8, and, and 10. Now, Paul, being an Old Testament rabbi, certainly knew wisdom literature. Wisdom literature is characterized by parallelism. It's one of the most powerful Old Testament tools to reinforce, magnify, and define Old Testament words and theology. Notice, notice this parallelism. Verse 6, while we were helpless. Verse 8, while we were yet sinners. Verse 10, since while we were enemies. Now, friends, that goes back to Romans 1.18 through 3.21. We're enemies. There's a problem. We all need him. Now notice what's happened. In light of our need, catch the parallelism. Verse 6, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8, Christ died for us. Verse 10, uh, through the death of Christ his son. Do you catch the parallelism there? We were in need. God provided that need in Christ. Uh, all of your hymns you sang today was such a wonderful thing the Spirit did by putting those hymns together that all talk about the blood of Christ. Now, friends, Old Testament speaking, blood is an Old Testament idiom for life. An innocent life was given. Now, I wish I had time to go into the Greek here. The word far is the Greek preposition who pair. It means uh, far on behalf of. But it is many times parallel to the Greek preposition anti, which means instead of, as a substitute for. Friends, this is Isaiah 53 stuff. Remember when John the Baptist first saw Jesus, John 129, John 129, and he said, you can quote this with me, I know, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. God has provided everything we need but we must receive it by faith. Um, I love you all. I really enjoy being here. I thank God for what you are in our community, and I'd like to pray just a moment. Lord, we come to you. Uh, we, we just don't have vocabulary to thank you for what you've done for us. Why? Why would you love us? We know ourselves, and we're amazed at your love, and a love that will not let us go. And a love that has pursued us through our, our days of unbelief, through our, through our sin, you have pursued us. But God, you've pursued us for Christ's likeness, that we might be a light of love and hope and truth in our day. That people may, as, as the roll call of saints in Hebrew of 11, see our love and faith, not perfection, not sinlessness, but our love and faith and be drawn to you. Thank you, Lord, that someone told us about you. Help us that our words, that our actions, that our lifestyles, that our priorities would draw people to you. Oh, Lord, we know this world belongs to you. And we know that people show who they are by how they live. But we pray that you would have mercy on us. So many times in the history of this world, you have sent undeserved, life-changing, societal revivals. It is our fervent prayer, Lord, not because we deserve it, because of your great love, that you would let us in our day see people turn back to you, that there might be hope for our country. We thank you for what you're doing in the world. We thank you for what you're doing in South America and Africa and Asia 
Oh, Lord, for the thousands and thousands that are being saved every day. We pray that our family and friends and neighbors might come to know you too. And we ask that nothing in our lives, our vocabulary, our priority structure would ever turn anyone away from this wonderful good news that has so changed our lives. We love you. Help us honor you with our lives and our priorities, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.